Chris Plummer played Henry V magnificently. He was the pride of the company. It was so obvious that Chris was going to go to great heights, which he has, of course. I was actually the first young Canadian to lead the company because up, up to that time they had stars come over like Alec Guinness, Irene Worth, and, and James Mason, and Frederick Volk from London, and all those sort of people. But it was the first time they had a Canadian leading man. And I had that scary responsibility. Well, the last big Henry was, I suppose, the old Vic with Richard Burton, who was kind of a, a, a young and surly prince. And all oh, very well, as you know. Um, the other one before that was Laurence Olivier's movie in the 40s, which still sort of hung over everybody as the definitive Henry V. So it was hard to cut across about, like, what? Ten years later, that was all it was, with a kind of new interpretation. But we did, I think, succeed without ruining the trumpet guns that the part demands, because vocally it's a huge part, and I was, thank God, able to do that and still play him in the early part of the play as a rather angry young rebel, which was very popular at the time, because Osborne and Wesker and all those playwrights had just formed a new kind of theater. And Look Back in Anger was the sort of play of the time. And it was a whole new movement. And so, so Henry V fitted er, rather well into that pattern. It, it, it develops him from a rebellious youth, which was still hovering through the early part of the play, into a very scared young king before the big battle of Agincourt. And then he realizes during the prayer that, of course, uh, he becomes a man uh, and a king and a soldier all at the same time. He, he, he grows up before that battle begins. So it did have a nice build. The combination of Plummer's performance, Langham's staging, and the energy of the Francophone actors made Henry V truly memorable. But when that fourth season finally ended, it marked a farewell to performing in the tent, which caused mixed emotions in many of the company. Well, I adored the tent, and uh, unfortunately, when it left, um, I still think an awful lot of the adventurous and the spirit of this place and the excitement went with it. And I don't mean to say that it didn't, that it isn't marvelous now or anything like that. But those early years were glorious years because they were new. It was an experiment. We didn't know if it was ever going to take off, even in 1956. And certainly, with me walking out of the stage, it could have closed. But uh, I, I, I wouldn't miss those days for the world because they, the tent represented a, a, a not a permanent feeling, which made us work all the more hard and and better, I think, and compete with each other in a sort of kind of like being in an arena. And uh, the spirit was extraordinary. Also, the first year, uh, the last year of the tent, we had, I think, possibly the best. Uh, season that Canada has ever seen in a theatre with the French Canadian company, the Théâtre de Nouveau Monde, and the English boys on the same stage at the same time. They talking their own language at times, and we talking in the English. And it was the perhaps the last time we were ever to see the formation of a national theatre in this country. And boy, was that an emotional year. The two languages on the same stage, not only politically, but but emotionally and and, and nationally, it was an extraordinary feeling. And it, when we took it to Edinburgh Festival, it didn't have quite the same impact as the Edinburgh the people in England would could probably care less about the, the differences between the French and the English here. But here, oh, it really and sadly that has been repeated, but not to that extraordinary uh, extent. And uh, I feel that I wish to God that would come back. And one day we must have a national theater here with both languages playing at different times in the same theater. And the actor they were looking at that season was Christopher Plummer, who faced his first Hamlet unafraid. No, I, I was not that daunted because, you know, you're pretty arrogant when you're 26 and you've already had a success. You know, it, it, fear doesn't, or sensitivity of that kind doesn't even enter into things. No, I barreled ahead. 
I, I uh, was much better later when I played it, but I think you can't play Hamlet properly until you're probably 70 years old uh, because it, it needs a whole lifetime of, of wisdom and technique and, and maturity and, and a kind of calm thing that uh, can bring up those words and make it totally believable that someone of 26 would never speak like that, for God's sake, in reality. Can you imagine at the pub, sitting around with Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, and they're all getting drunk, and Hamlet delivers that extraordinary speech. They say, he's out of his mind drunk, get him out of here. Nobody speaks like that. <laughs> Where did he learn to speak like that? I admired his Hamlet enormously. It was very moving. It was, it was wonderful. Are there any specific moments from it you remember? Well, I remember when we were on the stage and he was doing the Alas, Poor Yorick, I remember him, Horatio. It was so moving. And his death was so moving. And when, when I stood over him and said, uh, Good night, sweet prince, it still brings tears to my eyes. What, you, you say that he was so moving. What was the quality about it? Was it a vulnerability, a, a depth of emotion? Chris has a way of bringing a reality to a part. He is so believable in what he does. William Hutt went on for me one night, one matinee, because I broke my foot, and uh, Tanya had made, Tanya Mojevich had made me a wonderful fiberglass cast that I could sort of walk around with with a kind of thing at the bottom of supporting it. And I got more sympathy from that damn cast than I mean, I kept it on when the foot was even better. <laughs> because you just walk on with a cast and they say, oh my God, poor guy. Yeah, I hardly have to act at all. Well, Bill went on for when I was in bedridden one matinee. And he was, I kept lying in bed gnashing my teeth and jealousy, saying, God, I hope he's not better than I am. <laughs> and two guys came back who might like paid, like moles. Watch the performance and give me a full report. And they came back at the end and they said he was absolutely marvelous. I thought, I thought that bastard. And they went on describing how much quicker he was in the part than I and that the curtain came down at least half an hour earlier and that the audience went out wanting more. And I, I was going to kill these two guys. I thought, those traitorous bastards. Except, and then one of them except that there was one mistake he made. Out of nerves, perhaps, but just one. I said, what was it? <laughs> what was it, tell me? <laughs> he said, at the end of his... When he tries to kill the king, the lion is here, thou incestuous, murderous, damned Dane. Follow my mother. And he pours the drink down the king's throat. But that afternoon, in clear, William Hutt, perfect diction tones, he said, Here, thou incestuous, murderous, damned Dane, swallow my mother. I thought, great. The Freudian inclinations were immense. <laughs> and I was a happy camper again. <laughs> the magic was also in comedies like Love's Labor's Lost and Much Ado About Nothing, directed with the lightest of touches by Michael Langham. I think he was probably more suited in a funny way as a director to, to high-styled comedy than he was to tragedy. Uh, his sort of refined thing that Michael has uh, in, his, in his makeup and, and his wit, which he has enormously quick wit, suited, uh, suited him to, to direct restoration um, almost better than anyone. And... Um, and, and a very high comedy, like Much Ado, which is high comedy. Uh, and Love's Labor's Lost, w w a few years later, which he did the most enchanting and miraculous and souffle of a production. I mean, he created these soufflés, and Much Ado was one of them. And it was also a souffle, but it was real, because we had a, a, a truth. It wasn't just style. It, there was a heart underneath it, of which Michael had, too. So the combination of that heart and that style, I think... Those are his finest contributions as a director. But even though everyone loved that production, there were others, such as Peter Coe's staging of Macbeth, starring Kate Reed and Christopher Plummer, that would prove more controversial. 
it had a very Bruegel-like look, I remember. He would have people in little tiny groups, knotted groups, all over the different parts of the state. And he had us all kneeling all the time, which, which is, of course, ever since my arthritis has... I blame Peter for my present state of arthritic pain. Uh, that was tough, but, but he, he wanted the sort of cave, cave-like cave atmosphere of, of, of early Britain. Uh, and uh, I thought that was an excellent idea. And strangely enough, it was very ahead of its time because it had not that had not been seen too often with Macbeth. Uh, it was also very Brechtian, his approach. Brecht being rather fashionable at the time, uh, had taken over. His influence on the theater had been extraordinary in the, last, in the few years before. And Peter was a disciple, too, of Brecht, as, as indeed some of all of us were. And it had a Brechtian feeling of, of uh, bleakness and, and irony and wildness about it. And I think perfectly right. I mean, you felt he wanted to give the impression that these people never washed, which they didn't, and that uh, they just lived. The castle was something made out of part of nature. It wasn't a castle like, gl- like Glam's, which is perfectly ridiculous, of course it wouldn't be. And that all those things at that time were were, were rather like mm, just higher and more successful peasants that they weren't particular aristocrats.